Good afternoon, everybody. All right. Uh, my name is Jonah Clevisall, Senior Account Executive with Jamp Software uh, on the Enterprise team. I'm really excited to see this presentation, uh, not because it's way over my head, but just because uh, there's a lot of really cool information in here uh, that I think you guys are going to find useful and can apply to what you do every day, which is the point of the whole conference that we're here for. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Jason and Arik and learn a little bit about user interface experience for your users. Hi, everybody. Can you guys hear me? Yes. All right. If not, I can yell a little louder. All right. So in case you didn't know, we're here for add pop and practicality to a clean user interface. Uh, what does that mean? Well, we'll get into that in a minute. Um, a, little, a little more information about us. So I'm Mark. I'm a system engineer at Code42 right now. Worked at Genentech, worked at Salesforce, worked at Apple a little bit. Um, and also an entrepreneur doing my own little startup company. You'll, you'll hear a lot more next year about. Uh, and then Mac Brains. Everyone, anyone know what Mac Brain is? Who's coming to the party today? So yeah, we, we run the community organization out in the Bay Area. Uh, so definitely check that out. And then uh, Jason, State Farm. OK. Uh, I know him. I've worked with him. I've presented with him a few times. Uh, great guy. You'll, you'll get to meet him very soon. All right, so our agenda. First off, we're gonna teach you how to slow your roll. That's very important. Uh, and uh, it's, it's something that we all need to do uh, when we're actually creating any products or any solutions. Uh, is definitely slow things down and really think, take a step back, and look at things from a uh, further perspective. And then there's more than one way to do it, right? The term, you know, there's many ways to skin a cat. I'm a cat guy, so I'm not going to use that. Uh, but we're going to talk about some ways to, uh, to really show you how the different tools are out there to actually get things done. And then Jason's going to really show you the good stuff. He's going to show the money. Uh, and that's the, the, the creative ways of using these different, different tools to actually create uh, some awesome solutions uh, for, for your corporation, your small business your enterprise, wherever you may work. So slow your roll. So what do I mean by that? Uh, first off, whenever you're starting a solution, close your text editor, like just quit out of it. Uh, we always want to just start coding, right? Who who's just loves scripting? Anyone love scripting? Figure that much. Us Mac guys, we have to script a lot. But stop that. Uh, you definitely want to define, you know, what, what you're trying to accomplish, and why are you really doing it? Because sometimes you may stop there uh, and not actually have to do anything, and you're done. You can move on to bigger and better things. And you really need to understand who, uh, who's being impacted. Uh, with user dialogues, uh, that's your customer base. And who are these people? What are these personas? Uh, you've got different type of characters. You've got the people that see a pop-up, and first thing you do is click OK, or whatever it is. And then you're like, and you're wondering why there's all these weird, weird malware issues and stuff going on in your in your you know, organization. And then you've got the other people who just go ahead and see a dialogue. Then they're like, oh, dialogue, help desk. I just uh, I just saw something pop up on my screen. Uh, I don't know if I can click this. Uh, yeah, you called about this last week. Uh, but yeah, so you've got different personas, uh, and you got to find that balance of kind of managing managing the two or three or more. Uh, every organization is different, but there are some common ones. And then really, really step back in workflow. Uh, look at the bigger picture. What are the different components involved? What are the systems? Uh, kind of from an architecture perspective, really start focusing on um, what are the little pieces I need to do? What are the images? What's the collateral? What are all that? And how is that all going to work together? Uh, just to make sense, see so makes if it makes sense, if it'll work together. And then once you've workflowed it, create a wireframe. So if you're going to do a dialogue, even if it's a simple uh, terminal notifier notification or something, you know, show an example of what it's going to look like, uh, and really test that out with your with your peers and make sure that it's going to satisfy and really fit those personas that you're accomplishing. And then. You know, when you're ready, choose your secret weapon. And I'll go into some of the tools 
Uh, who's seen UI in a Unix world from last year? Watch the videos. So I'm not going to go into a lot of the details of all the different tools, uh, but I'll give you, uh, you know, an overview of, of those and a couple of new ones to look at, um, just to kind of give you a foundation. You can always check back on those videos for more information uh, or follow the, the links that are going to be on these slides. So from a workflow wireframe perspective, anyone use Curio? Well, I kind of like it. I like colors and stuff. That whole pop thing, that was my idea. Um, OmniGrapple. How about Visio? Boring. I don't know, I, I had to use that before, but it's no fun. Uh, how about wireframe? Do you guys use Baldonic? Anybody? Cool, I'm starting to use that a lot more, and it's, it's, it's great. So it kind of gives you a foundation of a way to create an overview of workflow, uh, what the screens are going to look like, um, and it also gives you your documentation at the end. So if a manager wants to see how does this work, instead of showing them a script that's commented, they're like, uh, whew, right? Uh, you have something that you can actually show that makes sense. Um, but if you can't afford either or prefer just to do it on paper, you could do that too, but you just can't reuse it as well as you can some digital media uh, products like those. So choosing your UI platform. Um, so there's a lot of different tools out there. Um, things to take into consideration, is this something that's already deployed? Uh, if you already have something out there, it's on all your machines, it's on your image, you know, that may be the, the one that you want to use. Is it something that's built into the OS? And what you also got to have to consider is that, is it built in on every version of that OS as well? Because Apple creates new features between, you know, Leopard, Mavericks, uh, Yosemite, things vary. Uh, and if you have a strategy that impacts a, a range of different operating systems and you're not, and you're using these tools that are built in, you may not be able to do the same, same sort of dialogues for, for those individuals. Support. Uh, who in your organization forces, basically you're forced to uh, have a product that's supported before you can implement it? Who prefers to go the unsupported route and have more fun? On a weekend, late evening, you know, football, Sunday, nobody likes that. Uh, also find something that you're comfortable with. Uh, there's a lot of tools out there. They told me that this remote was funky. That was my, like, my funny slide and it didn't work. <laughs> Pay attention to the sticker. It's because I like cats. All right. <laughs> so let's talk about some other tools. Uh, AppleScript, who uses AppleScript? It's been around forever and it works. I mean, some of the benefits is that you know, it runs on the older OSs. Uh, it's, it's there, it's part of, part of the you know, OS10 uh, toolkit. Simple, right? Simple workflow stuff. You can actually create a whole program and make it run like a program. Uh, you can start to finish and even embed scripts and do even more complex things. Uh, really nice, simple, but you know, kind of boring. Boring uh, user interface. Simple click next uh, results based on clicks. Um, nothing too too spectacular because it's been around for a long time. Plus, there's the debugging aspect of it. Have you gotten some errors and you're like, why isn't this working? And then you spend like weeks trying to figure that out. Anybody? Yeah, I've had that a few times. And it's not the greatest thing in the world. But if you want to learn more, uh, this is where you can get information uh, on AppleScript. Jam Helper. Anyone uses the Casper Suite here? <laughs> a few people? Yeah. I thought so. So that, that's, you know, that's bundled in with the Casper suite. Uh, and depending on which, which version of, of Casper you're running, uh, check to make sure you know, OS support is there for whatever versions are in your environment. Uh, but that, those, that, those sort of, report, uh, those sort of uh, version support things would apply to Jam Helper as well. Um, so just make sure it's compatible. But it's, it's great because it's got a variety of UI elements, a lot of UI options from HUD, full screen views, to controlling uh, the icons, and, and doing things, and also integrating with 
your JSS to really take actions, uh, killing Jam Helper. Um, a lot of flexibility with that, uh, and it's supported by Jam software. So if something is going wrong, you can always call your support team. It's always fun. And you can find more about that just getting it through the help. Coco Dialog. I know I've talked about this a couple of times, and who uses it now? Because usually there's only like two hands. I'm seeing a lot more. Awesome. It has been updated in a while. I don't think there's been some changes, some Ruby integration, um, but it still works. And it supports older operating systems. Um, and you've got a lot more GUI elements. Um, really unique things to do that you can do with it. Uh, and we'll go, kind of go into some of that as well. But it's also, you know, it's simple to learn because it's just kind of following a structure. But actually when you look at, if you have a lot of notifications and you look at your script, it's a syntax headache. It's just all these quotes and stuff and you're like, ah, if you make a mistake or delete something, it's, it could be a nightmare as well. But for more information, check out that link as well. <laughs> Terminal notifier, who uses it? Two more people than last year. <laughs> so that's, that's supported with 10.8 and higher. Is, is the reason you're not using it is because it, you have older operating systems? <laughs> True, that's another good reason. I right, since you do use Casper Suite here. Um, notification center messaging, that's basically what it does, and Casper does it. Um, cool thing about it, you can also brand it your own and make it your, your own company logo and change the name so that it's coming from you. Uh, so that makes it really uh, really good for ensuring that you know, your employees don't freak out when they see a pop-up, that it's coming from somewhere, it's coming from your organization, uh, or something that they're you know, used to seeing, so it helps. More information there. Xcode, anyone develop projects from scratch? Great. Good. So it's very powerful. It's enthusiastic across uh, OS X versions, um, depending on how you compile it. And it's truly hand built. So you actually give it the interface. You give it the look and feel. You have control over the back end. Uh, so you can do magical stuff like uh, we've Mac AD, uh, Mac DNA, uh, if you've seen some of those presentations. Those are all built on you know, using Xcode. It also gives you flexibility. Swift, who's, who's transferred to Swift? Nobody, a couple? Swift, Objective-C, Apple Script, uh, leverage any kind of scripts that you want uh, and integrate those UI elements to really make it into a full feature uh, notification tool. And more information there. Python, who uses Python for GUI stuff? Oh, I know this guy, yeah. <laughs> So Bryson, uh, Bryson actually presented at MacBrain at uh, one of our events uh, from Minneapolis uh, via stream, and he presented on actually using Python in the standard libraries to really show GUI interaction uh, that's available to, across platforms outside of the Mac as well. Um, pretty powerful in that sense. And the, the libraries will extend out as to you know, any platform. And it's, and it's easier than Xcode because it's more, it's more of a scripting type of an approach uh, rather than a development uh, language type of approach. Uh, but it's the same sort of customization uh, capabilities as, as what you would get with Xcode. Um, leveraging the standard library, AT, Kinter, you know, Python, Objective-C, uh, a lot of tools out there to actually give you those GUI elements uh, that you can use across all three of these platforms. More information there and then more importantly, if you want to check out Bryson's presentation, uh, which has the, the, the guts, and also will kind of give you an insight of you know, moving from, from a bash scripting perspective to a, uh, a Python scripting with GUI, uh, that's, follow that link uh, for that information. I had to. <laughs> One last thing. Actually, a few last things. Um, always, you know, if you're working with dialogues or you're presenting anything on screen to uh, anybody, <coughs> consider all the form factors. I think the challenge where I found is uh, MacBook Air, the 11-inch, the screen, if you're 
creating custom windows. Uh, that screen's a lot different than, uh, than all your other devices. And also retina support. Uh, there's a lot of different things that you gotta think about. So you know, really focus on what types of devices are in your organization that you're managing, uh, and then ensure that whatever strategy you're using applies. And stay concise and clear. If, if you can't get your message across simply, people are gonna either click okay, and they're gonna click okay on other things they shouldn't be clicking okay on, or they're gonna call you. Um, so it's all about just keeping it simple, getting your message across, here's what we're doing, here's what we need to do, click next, click okay, whatever it is. And make sure there's a way out. Have you ever scripted something where it gets you in a loop? All right. We've all made that mistake. And if you're doing something that you're deploying out with a GUI to, to a lot of users, you do not want that problem because that is, that is your worst nightmare. You're gonna be remembered for that. Oh yeah, that's the guy who uh, rolled that out and I couldn't do anything because I was just getting a dialogue after dialogue after dialogue. Uh, oh, and I rebooted and it's doing dialogue after dialogue. So definitely don't get trapped. Uh, parts may be missing. So if you're, if you have a complex solution with a script, with GUI, uh, with images uh, that you're sourcing, chances are some of those items may be gone, right? If you're relying on stuff that maybe you deployed months ago, that you're looking in, in the standard uh, directory for certain images, and maybe the images changed and something was removed, you don't want a big throw up on the screen because something's missing. So always look at that and find a, make sure you patch it so if something's missing that you give it a standard image, uh, something like that so it makes it you know, good from a user perspective and user experience. <coughs> and details really matter. Um, spelling, I don't know if you guys noticed, so I'm very embarrassed. My last JNUC, I was working on my slides up until like the last minute, but I had, I had this one phrase, you know, my, my big key points like, if you don't really you know, show and prove yourself, you know, no one's gonna really you know, appreciate you. And I misspelled a major word in there. It was like autocorrect, didn't fix it. That's, that's bad, I don't think anyone noticed it. But now if you watch the video, you're gonna be like, oh yeah, what, what, a, what a dumb, <laughs> dumb guy. Uh, and also think about cadence too. So you don't wanna do dialogues all the time. It's like the, the boy who cried wolf, right? You don't wanna constantly be a nuisance. You only want it when it's really necessary. Um, so target you know, only times where you actually have to do some user interaction uh, or consolidate. So do it on a quarterly basis. Uh, don't do it too often. That will also uh, bite you in the end. Uh, and time zones, who has organization that's all over the place, right? So definitely uh, go for universal time or something consistent where you can figure out what the good time for pop-ups and, and tasks are uh, based on regions. Um, that's something you definitely don't want to impact your users in like the busiest part of their day. And I've said this before, uh, always, always make it shine. Uh, make it your own. You're going to be remembered for the stuff that you produce. And especially if it's a GUI or a UI, uh, that's the thing that you know, everyone sees. So now I'm going to ha hand it over to, uh, to Jason. It's going to show us the money. Oh, yeah. Like Art said, my name is Jason Borkhart. Uh, I'm not sure if anybody saw my session last year. I was not allowed to say who I worked for. Now I actually am. It's at State Farm, so now you know. We're going to go over a couple things. We're going to go over what I call good neighbor, and we're also going to go over our software distribution. So before we dive into it, can we give a hand to Jam for the software distribution stuff they announced this morning? He's excited about that. I had a minor heart attack when they announced that, and I said, oh, I gotta look at my slides. But we're still gonna be okay, there's a lot to learn here. So, first thing I'll talk about is the welcome agent. Now, first off, I'm really proud of that name that I came up with. Nobody else thought it was genius, but I thought the branding was good. <laughs> um, we really, really like everything that you can automate. The, the better a user experience that a user can have, the more happy that we are and the happier that the user is. So things like device enrollment program, VPP, th those things are really, really cool. And we wanted to say, okay, well, how can we bring something like device enrollment program on iOS to the experience that people want to have on OS X? And a lot of that is coming in Yosemite, but 
obviously we weren't able to use that yet. So we came up with Good Neighbor, and Good Neighbor is something that will show up every time the person logs onto a machine for the very, very first time. It looks like this. We can brand it. This is going to be an example of Cocoa Dialog. It's just a simple pop-up that says, hey, welcome to your machine. Let's get started. Now, I'm going to take a little course uh, diversion here. How many people would have recognized those three ovals as the State Farm logo without the word State Farm? Let my lawyers know that everyone in their room raised their hand and I should be allowed to use that logo. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but let's, let's move forward and actually talk about technical stuff here. What does this do? This captures credentials for Active Directory Kerberos, it captures credentials for LDAP, it configures the Exchange account and their Exchange picture. So all that the user sees is that button that says click OK. It asks them for two passwords using a secure input box. And this is all documented on Coca Dialog's website. And then it does a bunch of stuff in the background that makes everything 100% automated, a great, great user experience. And one other thing I want to say, Arik had a lot of links to all the documentation for each different program that we're using. I'm going to put these slides on Jamf Nation probably almost immediately after I'm done. So if you didn't write them down, don't worry about it. All this stuff's going to be up online after the session. Let's keep going here. It is funky. There we go. So why do we want to capture the Active Directory and Kerberos credentials? Well, I can't grab those credentials right when somebody logs onto the workstation. Obviously, I'm not going to be able to get it out of that password box, but it is still important to have those. We can configure their Kerberos realm. We can configure Exchange for them. You can configure intranet, web pages, and even Link. So we have Link pre-installed on the workstations because everyone uses Link in the Windows world as well. So all I have to do is open it for the very first time, and they're logged in. There's no setup process. There's no steps that could confuse them. Since we're grabbing that password using Coca Dialog on the welcome agent, we can put it in a link in any other application that may use it. And all we're really doing is putting that in the keychain. So I was told I had to block out a lot of sensitive information. That's why it looks the way it does. But we can see right on there, we've got link set up, and the user never did anything. It all goes into the login keychain. We're also going to cap capture your LDAP credentials for proxy because at State Farm we use LDAP for proxy, and we use Active Directory for other things. So we'll set up your browsers. Chrome, Firefox, they're all automatically configured based on those keychain entries that we made just from that one simple script that people ran when they what they ran automatically as soon as they logged onto the machine. And then we have other scripts like we call uh, directory lookup. We use the Apple script for that. People can just look up information about another person. It uses LDAP account and they can just search without having to log into anything. That script does everything for them. So again, seamless automation put all that code behind everything and just give something that looks really native to, to the business partner or the, the user. So another thing I'll talk about here is our lockout notifier. This is a great example of how to use terminal notifier. And this is another example of the, the branding that self-service can give you with their icon, but you can put your own icon to create something familiar. So let's be real, lockouts are going to happen. People are going to type, type their password incorrectly. Applications are going to misbehave. You cannot prevent lockouts you can make it a better experience. Uh, I have a Windows workstation at State Farm as well, and I remember the first couple of weeks I was working there, Outlook kept popping up asking for my password. I said, what am I doing wrong? Am I typing the wrong password in? Am I getting the LDAP and Active Directory passwords confused? I, I did not understand what was happening. And then Link wouldn't let me sign anymore. And I realized I had at some point locked myself out of my account, but nothing was there to tell me that I did that. So it was just a very poor experience. So we have a script that runs as a launch daemon in the background. All it does is it looks for the Active Directory attribute lockout time. If you're not locked out, it's going to be zero. If it's anything other than zero, the account's locked out. It's going to list it in Unix time, and you have to do some simple math to convert it to readable time. And I've got a post on Jamf Nation that'll actually do that math for you if you want to check that out. The one other thing it does is whenever somebody gets locked out, it generates an email and automatically sends it to our mailbox for us to troubleshoot it. So when I started working at State Farm, we were getting lockouts quite frequently. There was a bug in OS 10.8 with Kerberos where it would send two bad password attempts instead of just one. So if we had six bad passwords would lock you out, it would do it in three. And we couldn't figure out why people were getting locked out so much. And what we had happen is we made, wrote the script so the last 200 lines in the system log would be combined with the current running processes, all formatted into an email sent to our team so we could look at the trends and says, what, why are people getting locked out? What apps are open? What are people doing? Did they really just type their password in wrong six or three times, whatever it's going to be? And it helped us get our lockouts down a lot lower than they were before because we could see why it was happening. 
So I should have a screenshot here. This is what it looked like. So we've got the branding right there against the three ovals. People recognize what that means. It says your account's currently locked out. You can do some math to say, okay, here's when it's going to unlock. And we have a note saying if you need to be, have it unlocked immediately instead of our timeout, you can contact ITSS. Everyone at State Farm knows ITSS to be IT support services. They've got stickers in the bottom of the laptops with the phone number of who to call. But that's, that makes the whole experience better. Lockouts are not fun, but at least now they know why it happens. So next, let's talk about the software distribution. We developed this, I think we started working on it about two years ago because we have a lot of people watching us from, because we have State Farm Bank, we've got all the different types of insurance with health and we've got to do PCI as I'm sure a lot of you have to deal with. And a lot of these requirements say you have to have a security patch every 30 days or every month. And when I started, the security patch basically was, okay, we patched these pieces of software this month, so we're going to push it up to everybody this month, whether they have it or not. Or, whether they're already up to date. It was not really smart, it wasn't very intuitive. We would have policies set up, one in self-service, and then another one for the set to ongoing, whatever it would be called via trigger. It worked, but I didn't think it was that great. So these are three scripts that are all completely written in Bash, but use all the tools that are talked about that are all completely free to make it look like it's a built-in process that people are familiar with, and our patch process is something that we're very proud of now. First piece is gonna be the software scanner. So this is a script that runs actually once every 30 minutes. We have our JSS configured a little differently. Instead of taking inventory once every week or once every day, we do have it submit every 30 minutes. That does make your database get a little large, so before anyone gets any crazy ideas, make sure that you are flushing your database before turning, or flushing your logs before you turn this on uh, this quick. But what this allows us to do is have a script run every 30 minutes that just scans all the pieces of software on the machine. We wrote, a, we wrote, I think we've got something like 60 different pieces of uh, software in there that are not supported in this script. And all it does, the whole purpose of this app is to scan and then write the results to a text file. So if three applications are out of date, it'll say what those applications are in a text file. The user doesn't see any of that. Once a week, users will get an alert using Cocoa Dialog that has a little bubble saying, hey, Google Chrome, or this piece of software needs to be updated. But we don't want to harass them, just like Arik was saying, we don't want to have pop-ups every single day or every single hour because people will get frustrated with them. We only wanted to do that once a week so people would actually read it instead of dismissing it right away. In an emergency, though, this script, we do have it configured to automatically install software. If there's some kind of zero-day job of vulnerability, um, we will make it so it'll install software based off the trigger. We have all of our policies set up so it's available on self-service, it's ongoing, and they all have triggers that are the name of the application. So when Software Scanner runs and it dumps out the name to a text file of that application, the next scripts we'll talk about can immediately see that name and just call it triggered. We don't have any duplicate policies for the same piece of software. We only have one for everything. It makes everything a lot simpler. So like I said, this is gonna be online, but the easiest way to read the version of an application is gonna be this command right here. I actually really want to open source the code that I'm using, but I'm still working with my lawyers on that. But uh, if I can share anything with you, it would be this guy right here. This will be available online. If you run this in a, script, in a script for the actual application, it'll dump out the exact version of an app that's running. So you can compare it against whatever you actually want to have on the machine or just dump it out somewhere. But that's probably the bread and butter of the entire process here. And there's that bubble I was talking about saying, hey, Google Chrome is available. Um, We've got it so the software update scanner will list not only the, the software, but it says, okay, I know that this is the icon that goes with it. This is if it's an emergency or not. Does it require a reboot? The user doesn't see any of it, but all of our other scripts can pick up on that. So next we'll talk about the software update script. Software update script is available to be called in two places. The main uh, place that people see it is going to be in self-service. So that's what our self-service looks like before 9.5 with all the, the little blue banners that say featured on it. Um, I think that's a pretty popular feature request to have those customizable now. I'm not sure if it's implemented yet, but that's where we've got uh, the ability to run software updates. And people, we encourage them to do that because the more often that we have people run software updates out of self-service, the less times that they'll actually get harassed when it's security patch time. So this script could be called two ways. Like I said, in self-service or by a security patch. And if I lose you, just, we can, I'll be available for questions after. But basically all that this does is it calls that software scanner and says, hey, what do I have to update? It reads that text file. 
and then it says, okay, well, I see all those triggers that are listed there. I'm just going to go ahead and install them. And that's what it looks like. It's another Coca dialog box. This is what's called a progress bar. And it can show, you can customize it. So this is the endless one. You can also customize it to just be 2%, 5%. We've got it in an incrementing loop every time it installs the next piece of software to jump up a couple percents to simulate progress. It looks like a native application that Apple's written or that's built into the OS, but it's just a bash script. But the user never sees that. What's really nice about this, though, is that it's dynamic. So your software update may be different than my software update, different than somebody else's, because that software scanner runs every single time. And it'll only list the applications that are actually out of date. So that's where the security patch comes in. This guy's fun. So we have this patch, this patch actually run daily. All this is is a wrapper really around the software update script. This is something that's going to use Jamf Helper. We'll get a screenshot for that in just a second. But every single day, this runs in the machine, and it just phones home to one of our web servers that says, is it time to go yet? It'll check for what we have as the enable date and the enforcement date. When we enable it, we give people five days to install the security patch. After five days, It'll check and it'll say, oh, it's the enforce date. And then it'll present a different pop-up saying, that's time to go. We gave you five days. But then when it's done, all it does is call the software update script because that's something that people are familiar with. It's very, very consistent. And it looks like this. So I'm not sure easily you can see this. I'll walk through this a little bit. This is the pop-up again. This is using Jamf Helper, which it looks like a lot of people here use Jamf, so solid. It'll say, do you want to install now or do you want to install later? You'll be reminded again tomorrow. But it'll tell you when the date it will be forced is. I'm not sure if you can read it, but it has the date in there. It's available in self-service. And it also will say, hey, please note that a restart is required. Because we notice that if we tell people in advance that a restart is or is not required, if it's not required and they're working on something, they may let that run in the background. Versus if it is required, they'll say, okay, well, I'll just do that tomorrow, or I'll wait for the enforced date, or I'll just do it when I'm finishing up on this. It's about giving that clean and consistent interface that people expect, and our adoption rate Matt's going to have to keep me honest, but I think that our adoption rate is almost close to 80% of our patches actually get installed before it's time to enforce it. People just learn to expect this from us. It works really well. It's a really, really consistent interface. This is what the whole thing is about. So with that, we left a lot of time for questions. So I'll invite Arik back up and take some time for questions. If anyone hasn't figured out, everyone hugged earlier in the keynote, so we wanted to keep that going. That's what that is. <laughs> so, who's going to get us started? Right there. Um, so you, uh, you allow them to update the app to do self-service. Do you uh, check to make sure the app is not also running when that happens? So the question was, we allow people to update the app through self-service. Do we also make sure that the app is not already running? The answer is yes. We use a lot of pre-flight scripts and post-flight scripts around all of our installers. Some of them can be, um, most of them can't be, like browsers or Flash. Flash will have check if any of the browsers are open. Java will have check if any of the browsers open. That'll be built into the policy with either a pre-flight script in the installer itself or built into the policy because you can have a package and then scripts that are set to run before or after, but we do check for that. Another question right there. So the question was, for a software update script, are we just checking Apple's software update server, or are we blindly checking the web? I should have gone into more detail with that. In the software scanner, we've got over 60 applications that are defined and what versions we want them at. And we would also does check that our internal software update server using the NetSys appliance with, how many people use the NetSys appliance here? Excellent, it's free. Definitely check it out, it can be run virtual, uh, virtually, but we, have, we just have it run or check everything that's built into the script. And what's nice about that is, let's say there's a new version of Chrome. We don't have to uh, um, edit the policy or anything. All we do is put the new package up in Casper Admin, and we edit that one script to say, OK, I want it to be this version now. And if it's an emergency, we'll have something pushed out immediately by changing another variable. But that just means that, OK, whoever runs the patch, whether it's the patch or software updates next, it knows that that's a version it's supposed to get, and it'll push that install it whenever. So what's really nice is, I have my local change management team convinced that we don't have to do change records because we're really not changing anything during the security patch. We've been packaging things throughout the, throughout the entire month, 
making them available. We've already tested it. So I don't know how to document a change because my patch is going to be different than yours. I may have already updated this on my own, but you didn't. So there's no way to document it, which has actually helped us deploy a lot quicker. So I hand up over here. The question was, if they are, if the application is open, what do we do to ask them to close it? The answer is yeah, we use, usually it's gonna be Cocoa Dialog, because it's, it's so customizable. We'll say, hey, go ahead and close it. Now, one part of the security patch that doesn't really apply that I didn't talk about is if it's at the login window, it knows that nobody's using it and it'll never ask, uh, it'll just fire all the way through. But if the application is open, we know that the computer is actively being used, we'll put a, a pop-up there to say, hey, please close it. And then we'll put it in a loop to, until it's closed, keep popping them up. But we do have a way to exit that loop so we don't annoy our users. Good. Job all time. <laughs> I got a question. Yes. Sorry, guys. Um, so like the, uh, I for your updates, uh, when, you, when you force a uh, restart, obviously you want to let them know. Uh, is there a reason why you're still presenting a dialogue for things that you could do in the background? The things that we do in the background, we usually just do. Oh, you just don't? Okay. Yeah, so any, so when there's like a zero day like Java vulnerability, that software scanner, that, that's just installing it. If the browsers are open, then we will present a pop-up saying, hey, you need to close your browser so we don't just kill out of all the work, but anything we can do in the background, we can. For things that are gonna require a restart, they know that it's gonna require restart because we tell them in advance, and then when it's done, it says, okay, now it's time to reboot. We don't just reboot the machine. They can keep using it, like other apps, while these things are installing. But as soon as that patch is done, it'll say, okay, we're gonna restart in five minutes. It has a countdown, because you can do a countdown in Jamf Helper, and at the end of that countdown, it'll restart itself, or you can just click restart now. You guys now have the floor again, sorry. <laughs> yeah, over here. Uh, is it good data? Excellent question. The question was about the good neighbor script and somebody changes their password, does the good neighbor script run again? And that's actually part of the beauty of it is since we're setting all these things up for them, whenever they want to change a password, we can have a script that change everything for them again. So good neighbor writes a receipt. Once it's run, it, it's done. But we're educating our users saying whenever you want to change your password, run this password change utility and then when they change their password, it'll do all that stuff for them. I just made somebody's day. I'm not sure who that was. <laughs> Did you? Because well, it works. If you, if you have control, you can control it. Because that way, then you updated the link application. You updated all the other things. It's all automated. It's better user experience. Are your Macs bound to Active Directory? Question is, are our Macs bound to Active Directory? Answer, yes. Is there a follow-up? What's your... Why? Both. So... <laughs> <laughs> So the question was, can they just go into system preferences and change their password from there? The answer is yes, but that's not gonna fire off that other script to update everything else. Realistically, they could log off, log back on, and the part of the welcome agent, it does, I guess I lied when I said it only runs once, part of it does run to make sure that it can access the internet, because if it knows that it can't access the internet or can't do certain things, it says, hey, this password is probably bad, and it will present a pop-up saying, oh, you need to update your password. So we'll capture that at the next login. So I hand up over here, I thought. Maybe I just already answered the question. All right. Yeah, there's a lot of stuff that you could do. You could technically capture passwords and change everything on the back end, but then you've got security issues. Right. Uh, plus OS 10 is just getting stronger and stronger and more secure, uh, and doesn't let you get away with all the things that you used to right. get away with. Limiting to that Aqua session. Uh, you first, then we'll go. So the question was, are you letting people know that you have two weeks to, uh, until you change passwords, until you have to change password as a countdown? Yes, we actually use terminal notifier for that too. Starting with 14 days, we'll notify once a day at 8 a.m. or whenever they log on next using a launch agent saying, hey, your password's going to expire soon. And then we put an action on terminal notifier so if you click it, it'll start that change process. It says click to do it or you can just slide it or dismiss it and it won't fire anything off. But that's a part of the process, yep. So 
So the question is about if it was a dynamic display about what updates are available. Now, which one are you talking about? Are you talking about the last one? This guy here? So this doesn't actually, do missed it. All right, here we go, let's try it again. All right, this actually doesn't list the updates that are available. This just says that they are. So the way it works is that software scanner that runs all the time, it always dumps out everything to that text file that everything else calls. So this calls the software scanner again, and it says, hey, a restart is gonna be required because it went to that text file. It saw what applications are out of date. Do they require a restart? It's, it's all based off that software scanner. So it, so it is definitely dynamic. Your patch is going to be different than mine because you may have installed software through self-service manually. If you want to list everything out, you can. Uh, Coco-Dialog lets you read the text file and just present it all. Mm -hmm. Just creative stuff as you want. Coco-Dialog is fantastic. I was hoping to see more hands raised when Arik asked the question. I hope next year we see even more. It's, it changes the way you can do a lot. Yes. <coughs> The question was, are you calling most of these things through the JSS or launched agents, launch statements and launch agents? It's a mix. Everything with the security patch and the software distribution, that's all by the JSS. Other things like the lockout notifier, the password changing stuff, that's all gonna be launch agents and launch statements. And the stuff when you log in and it detects that your password isn't correct for like the proxy or anything, that's gonna be a launch agent. But the cool thing, you'd be flexible to whatever you want. You know, whatever exactly. you wanna do, however you wanna implement, however you, your strategy is today. Uh, you can customize this. Exactly. How many people are already using launch agents and launch daemons? Awesome. Very powerful stuff. Question over here. Going back to how you said uh, earlier, you can connect to the, find a server on the internet and then it knows your password. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you do when people are off-site, no Wi-Fi, no internet? What's the thing you ask once per day? So the question was, yeah, sure. The question was about uh, password pop-up saying if it detects that it can't connect to the internet, does it just harass them once a day? How does it know that it, well, what if they're offline? So before I show that pop-up, I do a Jamf check JSS connection. If they can connect to the JSS, I know that their network is good. But if they can't connect to the JSS, well, that, it may not be the password that's the problem. They may just not have network connectivity, so I'm not going to ask them for a good password. And then after that, I also try to curl Google.com. And if it can't get to Google, that's the notifier of, hey, I can talk to the JSS, but I can't talk to the, to the internet. There may be something there. And if there is an outage, yeah, then we do have that issue where it may prompt for, a, uh, prompt for a password. But we do have an exit out of that loop. And inside of that password pop-up, you also have the ability, if you forgot it, there's a reset password button that'll open up our intranet page to reset your password there as well. And I've done it too before where you can also, if obviously you can't ping your internal JSS, you basically put up a dialog, connect via VPN, and you do a check, right? Oh, you're not connected, try again, you know, until, until they do it so that you can enforce that change. Uh, go down here and then up there. So how are you detecting uh, failures in your installation packages, like pre or post flight script fails with a non-zero value? How are you detecting that? So the question is, how are we detecting failures if there's a, if there's like a, a non-zero one value return code, how do, we de how do we detect that? The answer is our packages never fail. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> So the way that we detect that, usually someone will call us. I mean, that was a joke, but realistically, it really almost never does because of the amount of testing that goes in there. But failures do happen, and we try to account for those. There will not be any pop-up that the user sees. They'll usually just say, okay, something didn't work right. And we do monitor, we look at the package history, and we can, we can monitor trends really easily because we have a lot of things that phone home. But as far as an instant notification, we do not have any right now, no. And I'm sure from, from your side, uh, you've got compliance regulations as well. So. Every three days, you check to make sure that everything's patched and getting what those metrics are because they're going to ask you for them. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's, then you also know if it's not working. Oh, yeah. And we, yeah. we get told that something's out of date probably before the company even announces it. I don't know how we get this information, but somehow we do. <laughs> We've got another question up there. What? Go ahead. Okay, so the question was. Right. Um, the question was, what about spaces and triggers? Because we use the application name for, as a trigger. What about spaces? 
I'm surprised I don't see a smile on Matt's face about this right now. So when we were packaging Creative Cloud, there was Adobe Creative Cloud. There were spaces in there. And the triggers actually worked fine. You could just put it in quotes. If you do pseudo jamf trigger, uh, a policy dash trigger, you put it in quotes, it'll work fine. But not every script really likes quotes. So Cocoa Dialog, or Spaces, Cocoa Dialog is not a fan of spaces sometimes in the syntax. And so then you have to use an ASCII character that's not a space, but a blank white space character that doesn't, that looks like a space, but it really isn't. And Cocoa Dialog will accept that. But the triggers usually work fine. And sometimes apps, when they get release a new version, they change something slightly. So just mm -hmm. gotta watch for that too. Test, always test. Yeah. There was more over here. We'll go up to the top let's, first. Let's go to the top. The question is about multiple application versions of the same computer, and does the software scanner or the software distribution try to install the newer version or overwrite it? So there are two things that we do for that. One, we actually specifically allow for two versions of an application. We usually, we, I created it to be a beta and then the production one, so I could test new software on my machine without accidentally reverting back to the old one when I was testing something. But that grew into that scenario. If they have two versions of a piece of software on the machine, I can define both of them. It does not support more than two, but then I would challenge, why are we using something that requires three versions of a piece of software on the same machine? We haven't had a need to do that, but it doesn't sound like a great workflow to me. So I'm not sure if that's something you're running into, but we haven't had the need to do anything more. Okay. Yeah, we, it'll support two versions. It'll say, here's the production one, but don't do anything bad if you see this version two. And right below you. The question was about the password change app. Is that a web page? Is that an agent? How does that work? It's, it's just a program sitting on the computer. That, that's all it is. Because it, a web page will not have access to your, will, uh, to your login keychain. People do have the ability to change their password through the website. That's more for the Windows side of things. But we encourage our Apple users not to do that. We usually like just want them to use the, the process that we have built into the, to the, that's, the workstation. That's a challenge to them. I mean, we dealt with that too when I was at Genentech. Is when you have a lot of different uh, tools and services that have stored passwords and you do a change through like your web or whatever the appropriate web <laughs> method is without running the tool that you created to actually do all the keychain stuff, they're just gonna start seeing all these alerts and pop-ups of, oh, enter your password, and it is a nightmare from a help desk perspective. I mean, this actually really grew. I wrote the script not necessarily for as a password change utility, but because Apple's pop-up about unlocking the login keychain if you change it somewhere else is the most confusing thing possible <laughs> ever. Everyone agrees. And we had more tickets and calls generated from people not knowing what that was or how to use it than anything else. So we were trying to figure out a way to make it easy for people to change the password locally on their workstation as opposed to using the website so we would actually be able to control that. I'd be interested if anybody has any creative solutions for that problem besides what I'm doing and how to manage that. I know that we've got things like AD Passmon. Uh, you can create your different pop-ups, but if anyone's got a better way of managing that, I'm happy to talk about it because I don't know if anyone's come up with a perfect solution yet. It's, if you change your password somewhere else other than the workstation, it's difficult for the workstation to know what the new password is. I mean, it's like an escrow service where you have your infrastructure and then you have a connector to everyone's keychains and then you just update the password for them when they change. <laughs> it's, it's a complex Developers solution. listening. <laughs> I've been ignoring this side. Did I miss anybody on this side? Yes. The question was, where does the application version list live? Is it in the script that we push to the clients or somewhere else? I, right now it is in the script. It's hard coded in that script. It's probably the largest portion of the script. But I wanted to put it online so people can download it. Uh, people just download it and we only have to update it in like a text file instead of actually updating the script every single time. We had a little bit of a challenge doing that at first because of the different operating system versions. We had, whenever we had, so like for Pages and Keynote, for example, when we went from 10.8 to 10.9, there was a different version of the app depending on what OS you were running. And so it was difficult to have an entry for Keynote, but then say, but if it's this, this version, run this. If it's this version, run this. It was easier to build that into the script to have it check the OS version and then say, okay, well, based if it's this OS, here's a block of code for these apps and here's for 10.8. 
I feel like we're going to keep doing that as we migrate from 10 at 9 to 10 10. I haven't checked, but I'm assuming that the new version of iWork requires 10 10, and you're going to run into the same thing. Uh, let's do middle. Let's go, let's go up there on top. Okay. Okay. How often do you pull your active directory for that password lock? The question is how often do we pull active directory for the password lockout notifier? I'm pretty aggressive with it. I do it every minute. And no one's in, they don't complain. So they don't complain. One thing you have to understand about State Farm is State Farm owns the largest privately owned network in the entire, uh, in the entire world. It's either US or world. Last time I was told it was the world, but maybe it's the US now. We have so many directory controllers that it isn't even a blip. So when you compare the size of the Apple platform to the whole platform of State Farm, I was specifically told not to say numbers. But let's just say for the Windows side, we're talking about hundreds of thousands. And the Apple side, it, we're talking about nowhere close. I, I want to say what it is. I, do, I, just, I just told that I can't say that for some reason. That's special information. So are you embarrassed? That it's ten. Eleven. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna put an eleventh one out there. Just to figure it out. It's, it's, but I think a lot of people are living in that same world. A lot of people here are. We're Apple admins living in a Windows world, and a lot of the struggle is integrating into that Windows environment. And Apple's done a great job of making it a more enterprise, I'm gonna go on a little tangent here, but making it a little more enterprise friendly. That's the only reason that device enrollment program exists. There's no reason for device enrollment program to exist for your personal iPhone at home, or for your personal Mac at home. For volume purchase, there's no reason for volume purchase to exist except for enterprise. They are doing a better job at the integration. So, I wanna throw that out there. Get another one up there. It's, oh, oh, there's so many. <laughs> Hard to choose. The script with the software update uh, check, how many lines of code do you have there? So the script for the software update check. The script, the small script. So the, the question was, how large is the script that, the, that you talk about the software scanner piece yeah. of it? If I were to take out the definitions of what versions, I think it would be around 40, maybe less on Bash. And that includes, like, spa I like to space out my code. If I were to actually strip out all the spacing and make it as small as possible, I think it'd probably be something like 25 lines of code. Because we put it in a loop, and so we just say, here's the application name, here's the app where the directory is that it's located, and we can have that command, the default to read for the version, just run over and over again for every app. I mean, I go, I saw you. So. So the question is about the password change tool. Are we actually changing the password in that tool or are we still having them go through system preferences? That's a good catch. We, when they run it, it uses AppleScript to open up the system preference thing and have them type it in there. But we have another Cocoa dialog box pop up saying, when you're done doing that, click next so we can continue the process. I was looking into seeing if there's any, like, any kind of director or command line tool where I could force a new password. No. Sorry, I, I do not. So our hand go up over here. Rich? What's up, Rich? Uh, with your AppleScript and the uh, password uh, reset tool, are you having to enable universal access for that? So Rich asked a question that I should have answered before he even answered the original question. Uh, is, so he, he asked, are we having to enable universal access for our AppleScript to change the password? And the answer is yes. So where we enable that, does anybody, is everyone familiar with what we're talking about? So we enable that whenever we install Good Neighbor. Good Neighbor contains, like I said, all those background agents. And during the installation of the post flight, we check to see first is that service enabled, and then specifically is that Apple Script app allowed to present something to the user. And we check that every single time it updates in case something has been missed. So glad you asked that question. That's the chick said it. Haven't figured anything out yet, but that's that's what we do. Excellent question. Yes. So are you using JSS then for reporting, or are you dumping some kind of output text file into all of this? How is it working? So the question is if we're using the JSS for reporting, if we're just dumping it out to a text file. I'd ask reporting on what piece of it? Say it again. So like report, what kind of report, what information would you be looking for? So the 
love to follow up it was whether or not the Chrome is on a specific machine or is something failed. Whenever, whenever we update an app and we know it's security patch time, we do, we use the JSS, we monitor to see if there are installation failures. We don't sit on those pages, but a few times a day we'll see how things are going with that if anything has failed. We, um, we don't have any specific report. We'll have, in the JSS, you can have a home page to see like installations and failure, failures right there. So for really critical applications or profiles, we'll, I have those at least on my dashboard and we can see, hey, this is starting to trend this way or there was one failure, let's just check that out. The second question is, are you giving your users local admin rights? Some of them, if they have a business case. Yeah. This is something that I'm sure we could all talk about all day. There are some people that ha where everyone has local admin. There are some companies where barely anybody does. For our, our local admin process, we have somebody fill out a form, and the form gets routed to their manager, and the manager approves it based on whether or not they can complete their code of conduct training and their security awareness training. Once that manager, we, and we force the manager to put the dates in that they completed it as well, so they don't just rubber stamp it. We make them work for it and then they forward it to our group and we'll enable local admin for them. We'll, we'll put it into self-service so it can be enabled for that user, but they have to have a valid business case. So, to go along with that then, do you see anyone trying to bypass what you're trying to do as far as your admin? So the question was, do you see anybody trying to bypass what we do with, with local admin? Really, no. I th we've had one person delete the Apple setup done thing and run the setup process again, but then it also renamed their MacBook Pro instead of the actual name. It renamed it to like Aaron's MacBook Pro, and it made it kind of obvious that they were doing something they shouldn't be. No, they're not doing their remove JSS framework, no. Other questions? Sure. Yes. So the question is, how are we launching those password change agents? Is it like an admin or service account? And it's, they're actually launch agents. So do you know the difference between launch daemon and launch agent? Yeah. Yeah, so everything that requires the login keychain, we have run as a launch agent. Okay. With one exception, the, uh, the proxy passwords. So the proxy passwords, we also, we, we have a launch agent capture that, but we have it feed into a launch daemon that has access to the system keychain. And the reason being is just because you have a password in the login keychain that will allow something to get out onto the internet, does not mean that the system has access to those credentials. The system doesn't have access to your login keychain. So whenever somebody logs on, we have a, a, a daemon grab that password and automatically put it in the system keychain. Whenever they log out, it'll take them out of the system keychain and we put a, a utility account there so background services can still access the internet if needed. I see people leaving. Is it beer time? It's getting close, yeah. Last question. You win. So the question was, am I going to post? Am I going to post my code? I want to. I have to have my lawyer sign off on it. So we'll see how that goes. These slides will be online, and I've, I've posted throughout Jamf Nation different little snippets, um, which, if you add them up, could give you a, a decent representation of the full thing. But <laughs> not the full thing in the whole yet. So I think I think we're out of time. Uh, we're both going to be sticking around for a little bit here. So if you're happy to answer questions and. Thanks for all the questions and for coming.